evening. You may be seated. Evangelist Tate. We are now going to sing, lift every voice and sing. We're going to do the first verse because I only have the music for the first verse on the track. But if, we, if you guys want to sing the second verse, Akipala with me, we can do that also. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Please. At this time, we will have the invocation by Reverend Evelyn Collier Dixon. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Stony the road we trod, bitter was the chastened rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. But yet, with a steady beat, have not our wearied feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed? Father God, we come, and as we come, We've come over hills, and we've come over mountains, but we've come this far by faith, leaning on your everlasting arms. And we've been trusting. We've been trusting and praying, Father God. And we give you praise, honor, and glory tonight for that. We thank you, Father God, for the legendary nurses that are here tonight the ones who have blazed the trail for the profession of nursing. And we are eternally grateful for you, Father God, showing your love, your mercy, and your grace to us. So as we enter into this celebratory period tonight, we say thank you. We praise you. Thank you for the planning, Father God. Thank you for those that will receive tonight. And thank you for those who have made significant contributions. God, how we praise you, how we magnify you, and how we bless your holy name. And it is in him, Jesus, that we pray. Amen? Amen, amen. 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 On behalf of the National Black Nurses Day Committee, we'd like to bring to you the Health Ministry of Apostolic Faith Church, followed by the Beta Mu chapter of Lambda Pi Alpha Sorority, Valerie Hubbard, 
the Chicago chapter, National Black Nurses Association, Ethel Walton, followed by the president of the Alpha Eta chapter of Chi Eta Phi, Adrian Priester Corey, and followed by Provident Hospital Nurses Alumni Association, Louise Hoskin, president. Good evening and welcome. HBM members from AFC, would you please stand? My name is Dr. Algin Garner, and on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Horace C. Smith, our First Lady, Susan Davenport Smith, and the Apostolic Faith Church's Health Professions Ministry, I warmly welcome you to Apostolic Faith Church. We have come together this evening to recognize, honor, and celebrate you, our wonderful black nurses. You may be seated. National Black Nurses Day was first proclaimed in February of 1988, and 2020 marks the 32nd anniversary of this wonder wonderful celebration. Tonight, we humbly come together to honor and applaud the contributions made by our legendary black nurses and nurse midwives. Just a bit of history of a few legends. Mary Jane Seacole, born in Kingston, Jamaica, learned her nursing skills from her mother, who kept a boarding house for invalid soldiers. In 1854, she approached the war office in England, asking to be sent as an army nurse to the Crimea. She was refused. Undaunted, Ms. Seacole funded her own trip to the Crimea, where she established the British Hotel to provide a mess table and comfortable quarters for the sick and convalescent officers. She also visited the battlefield to nurse the wounded and became known as Mother Seacole. Her reputation rivaled that of Florence Nightingale. Harriet Tubman, also known as the Moses of her people, was enslaved, escaped, and helped others gain their freedom. Ms. Tubman also served as a scout, spy, guerrilla soldier, and nurse for the Union Army during the Civil War. As a nurse, she dispensed herbal remedies to black and white soldiers dying from infection and disease. Emma Reynolds, in 1889, Miss Reynolds, a young woman who aspired to be a nurse, was denied admission by each of Chicago's nursing schools on the grounds that she was black. Miss Reynolds, along with her brother, the Reverend Louis H. Reynolds, approached Dr. Daniel Hill Williams, seeking his influence so that Miss Reynolds could receive proper training as a professional nurse. Dr. Dan's solution to the blatant racism was to establish Provident Hospital and Training School, a private interracial medical facility. A few of our famous nurse midwives. Mary Cooley was among the last generation of, Mary, of granny midwives providing care to pregnant women across the rural south. Excuse me, across the rural south. Ms. Frances Hill was born on August 15, 1900 in Baker County, Georgia. She was recognized as a healer and advocate for healthy babies and liaison between the healthcare system and her community. Ms. Margaret Charles Smith was an African-American midwife who became known for her extraordinary skill over a long career. Despite working primarily in rural areas with women who were often in poor health, she lost very few of the more than 3,000 babies she delivered and none of the mothers in childbirth. This is just the tip of the iceberg of this powerful and legendary history. Today, approximately 10% of all nurses in the United States are black. We honor those legends from our past, but also honor those legends who are present. And I personally have a relationship with one of those legends who helped me get my career started as a psychologist. We are honored that you have joined us this evening and we pay tribute to your history. We remain grateful to all that black nurses have done and continue to do in service to all. I know that each of you will have a wonderful time this evening, and once again, I say welcome. Good evening. 
My name is Valerie Hubbard, and I'm the president of Lambda Pi Alpha Sorority. Will all of my sororists Lambda Pi Alpha stand? Thank you. So, Beta Mu Chapter of Lambda Pi Alpha Sorority was organized at Providence Hospital in Chicago under the guidance of Ms. Hulda Margaret Little in April of 1934. Beta Mute has the distinction of being the only chapter which has been active since its or or organization. Ms. Murtis Raglan Davis, a graduate of Providence Nurse Nursing Providence Hospital Nursing School was the first bachelor's president of the Beta Mu chapter. You may be, sitting, be seated. Um, thank you. The Beta, Mu, uh, the Beta Mu chapter is a nursing sorority dedicated to sisterhood, education, and community involvement. Our mission is to providing scholarships to deserving nursing students heightened community awareness of the continued need for appropriate health care through workshops and seminars, supporting various charitable organizations, providing mentorship to students, and assisting needy families by providing food and clothing. The Beta Mu chapter's ob objectives are to raise the professional standards of nursing by providing uh, by uh, establishing scholarship for nursing students, and also um, stimulating registered nurses to continue their education and participate in community service. In 2014, Lambda Pi Alpha undergraduate chapter was organized. Lambda Pi Alpha Beta Alpha undergraduate chapter was organized at Chicago State University. Are there any uh, Beta Alpha sororities of, present today? If so, would you please stand? Okay. Okay, thank you, okay. Thanks. So April 18 is our spring fundraiser and that's going to be a game day. In June, we will be given several scholarships to deserving nursing students. So if you are a junior in nursing school, please, uh, complete a scholarship application. It's due by April 30th. August 8th, we, will, we plan to participate in the Bud Billiken Parade. And September, we also plan to participate in United Negro College Fund Walk for Education. September 26th is our fall fundraiser, and that's usually a casino trip and a trip uh, and a shopping at uh, one of the outlet malls. So please feel free to join us in any of those activities. Membership is offered to registered professional nurses in good, uh, with good care, moral character and in good nursing standards, with good nursing standards. Please stop by our table up front to receive more information about Lambda Pi Alpha Sorority. We would love for you to become a part of this great sisterhood of final womanhood. Thank you and enjoy the uh, enjoy the National Black Nurses Day celebration. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ethel L. Walton. I like to use my middle initial. And I am representing today the Chicago chapter National Black Nurses Association. My president is unable to attend today, so I am standing in her stead to give you a glimpse of what the Chicago chapter National Black Nurses Association is. We were formed in 1973, and we are part of the larger National Black Nurses Association who was uh, put together and the head of that organization was Lorraine, Lorraine, Lorraine Sams. Lorraine, thank you, Sams. Um, we have been active since 1973. Some of the things that the Chicago Chapter National Black Nurses Association does is we are a membership organization. We have student nurses in our organization 
licensed LVNs and licensed practical nurses. We also have associate degree nurses as well as bachelor's, master's, and doctoral nurses. They are all welcome and are claimed as being part of our chapter. The Chicago chapter was the first chapter in Illinois, but I would like to mention that we now have five chapters in the state of Illinois. Every year we have an annual conference. It's at different places, and we are hoping to have Chicago represent in 2022. It will be held here. That's a big thing, you guys. <laughs> I would also like to say that we have scholarships that we also give out of our chapter, and we have health policy. We just went to the National Black Nurse Day, some of us in Washington. We have a strong health policy committee. We're fighting for legislation on the Nurse Practice Act. And we also have several, or, several um, committees within the Black Nurses Association that we send out emails, we have trips, we, we represent in any way that we possibly can to make nurses stronger. We also talk to our patients and we let them see that there are professional nurses that look like them and can treat them and can help them and can assist them through the complicated system and with insurance. We also would like for our Chicago chapter National Black Nurses Association members that are here today, would you please just stand so that they can see who you are? Thank you. We have our meetings on the second Saturday of every month, except July and August um, and February. Although we had a meeting this February, but we have them at the um, Lutheran Theological Center, which is located 1100 East 55th Street. It's very easy to get to on the second floor. We do have a table as well represented here today, and we do have membership applications, and we would love for you to join us. I kid you not, you will be very impressed, and we will not let you down. We're like a family. When you go through, we go through. When you have a death, we all have a death. They went through a whole lot of stuff with me. I've lost a son and a mother, and if it had not been for them, I don't know what would I have done. So again, thank you for this opportunity. National Black Nurse Day is a big thing, and welcome to what we consider one of the best places to acknowledge our own. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Will all the members of Alpha Eta chapter of Chi Phi sorority stand, please? Bishop Horace Smith, Dr. Sandra Webb Booker, and members of the National Black Nurses Day Planning Committee, and I am Adrian Priester Corey, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> I'm the president of Alpha Eta Chapter and also on the planning com committee. Uh, colleagues, students, friends, and family, on behalf of Alpha Eta Chapter of Chi Eta Phi Sorority, we welcome everyone to the 32nd National Black Nurses Day celebration. Alpha Eta Chapter is one of 142 graduate and undergraduate chapters across the United States and the Virgin Islands that make up this great sorority. It's a professional organization for registered nurses and nursing students representing many cultures and diverse ethnic backgrounds. Founded at Freeman Hospital in 1932, now known as Howard University Hospital, more than 8,000 registered nurses and nursing students hold membership in the organization. Our mission is to elevate the plane of nursing, 
develop a core of nursing leaders and above all else to give scholarships to nursing students. On behalf of our organization, we graduate the legendary nurse honorees and the midwife honorees for their outstanding contributions in the field of nursing. I want you to take a minute to look at our ad book because in the ad book you'll find our April 18th fundraiser. I see we got do, uh, competitive activities going on here. Um, and we would love for you to come out and join us. Contact information is in there regarding tickets. So that's uh, April 18th, and it'll be at the Serbian Center from 12 to 4. Thank you. On behalf of the Provident Hospital Alumni Association, we'd like to ask for all of its members to please rise. Provident Hospital School of Nursing graduates, please rise. We indeed acknowledge your presence here today and are indeed very grateful as you can tell, our keynote was your dean of the School of Nursing at Provident Hospital. So you are very near and dear to us. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Now what I'd like to do right now is just kind of loosen up a little bit. And I want to announce some of the individuals that I see in our audience, okay? And what I'd like to do is ask, would Linda Roberts please stand? Linda Roberts. <laughs> Linda Roberts is our nurse manager for the Center on Nursing at the James Thompson Center. She is our representative. She's always here to support us, and we thank you, Linda. We also have the Hispanic Nurses Association with us. I think they might be in the lobby, but their president is Lupe Hernandez. Okay, stand up. Lupe, Lupe was one of my students, okay. And then we also want to acknowledge their past president, who is now a board of director member, Susanna. Won't you please stand, okay. Okay, Susanna Gonzalez. And we'd also like to acknowledge some of our distinguished members in the audience. We have Colonel Retired Audrey Winfrey. Won't you please stand? Colonel retired Audrey Winfrey served in the Vietnam War as an American Red Cross nurse. And we applaud her for her service. We also have Lieutenant Colonel Carol Hobson in our office, who is a Desert Storm era nurse. I would be remiss if I didn't mention my Command Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major Clarence Green, who served in just about all of them from Vietnam. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Rupert Evans. Dr. Rupert Evans, is the PES chairman, and he, uh, as well as the PES director of health administration from Governor State University, and he is here today representing the Pello. Okay, thank you. 
Now, I'm looking for Marilyn Danzy, but I don't see. Is she here? She's not here. I wanted to introduce you to her because she is our nurse member from Provident Hospital who served in World War II. And she is still alive and well. I would also like to recognize Pam Robbins and Mildred Taylor. Won't you please stand? They are responsible for the health policy a committee with the Chicago chapter National Black Nurses Association and have organized a nurses lobby day for us, which will be March 4th. So if you want to go, we need you to go because we need to let uh, the, the state legislative officials know that we do not want unlicensed individuals at the bedside taking over our nursing services. We're going to stand our ground. We will be boarding the train from the downtown Amtrak station on Harrison on March 4th, and we will be there at 6 a.m. going to Springfield to meet with our legislative official. And everyone in this room, you have an invitation to join us. In our audience, we have Dr. Berlin Burrs. <laughs> former Dean of Chicago State University. Graduate of Provident Hospital School of Nursing. We also have Miss Nellie Miller, graduate Provident Hospital School of Nursing. Nellie, won't you please stand and wave your hand? Thank you. I don't see any additional members of Provident. Have I overlooked anyone? Oh, no. But you know, I do want to, and thank you, I want to recognize Major Retired Geraldine Peacock. Excuse me, Major, on your feet. I'm the Colonel, on your feet. Major Retired Geraldine Peacock. Thank you. She's a member of the healthcare ministry here at Apostolic Faith Church. So I've kind of worked the room a little bit, but certainly if I've overlooked anybody, oh, I do want to recognize somebody. I want to recognize the Alliance of Illinois Black Nurses Associate, Association, President Beatrice Nabucho. Could you please stand, Beatrice? There you are. Okay, thank you. And have your members to stand also. Won't you please stand, Alliance members? Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, and I want to recognize Sheila Harmon, graduate of Chicago State University, one of the leaders, administrators, Miles Square Health Center. And I would be remiss if I did not recognize Dr. Iris Shannon, United States Public Health Service. I think I've done pretty good. What do you think? I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much. You may consider yourselves officially welcome to the 
32nd celebration of National Black Nurses Day. And this is our 13th year here in the beautiful edifice of Apostolic Faith Church, where Dr. Horace Smith is the bishop. Thank you. Now, at this time, we will have libation. At this time, we want to give honor to those nurses who have passed away in the last 12 months. These nurses who may be, they made a difference in your lives. They helped you to get where you are right now. A nurse that you may have a special relationship with. Gwendolyn Mays, Alpha Eta Chapter, Libation. Barbara Valentine, Alpha Eta Chapter, Libation. Libation. Maxine Mays, Alpha Eta Chapter, Libation. Libation. And I have one more, bear with me. Marion Summage, Libation. At this time, I'd like the audience to let us know if there's anybody in your life, a nurse in your life, that was somebody special to you that you would like to honor and libation. I'm Rebecca King, libation. Christine Long, libation. Libation. Pearl Goodman, libation. Phyllis Berry, libation. Lydia Roberts. Okay. Lydia Roberts, libation. Deborah Taylor, libation. Laura Ellis. Laura Wicks. Oh, and Margaret Ellis, my apologies, libation. Well, <laughs> Gloria Curley and Virgie, and Bur Gloria Cur Curry and Virgie Jackson, libation. Dr. Loretta Lacey and Dr. Cynthia Barnes Boyd. Libations. Melinda Evans and Cynthia Royce. Libations. Okay, Ann Pryor, Libations. H. Lynn Cox, Libations. Fanny Williams, Libations. Juanita Rogers, Libations. One more. Mildred Lee. Mildred Lee, libations. Sharon Hatchett, libations. Modis Deering, libations. Did I see a hand over here? Yes, ma'am. Deidre Young, libations. Doris Des Moines, De Morris, libations. Julia Payne, libation. Dorothy Smith, libations. Mary Mitchell, libations. Elizabeth Taylor, libations. I'm sorry. Jaya Beeman, libation. Dr. Ellen Ellen Miller, 
libation. Vivian Dawkins. Vivian Dawkins, libation. A hand over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Dolores Satcher, libation. Shirley Atwood, libation. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. At this time, we're going to ask all of our nursing students to line up according to your institutions, and we will have the parade of nursing schools. Nursing students, to the rear, please. And the first nursing school is Can Academy, LPN and RNs. Please march down, students. This is our future, you all, Can Academy. Oh, can you go to, yeah, thank you. Is that Catherine? How you doing? Okay. <laughs> Chicago State University. Colleges of Chicago, Malcolm X College. Okay, Dawson, thank you. Now we have FTSE. Thank you, FSTE. First step to excellence, please come forth.
Scott School of Medical Careers. Please come forth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our parade of nursing programs. Let's give our future a round of applause. And I'm going to ask our soloist to please come forth, Evangelist Sheila Tate. Hi, everyone. Okay. Listen, I wanted to take us back a little bit. I wanted to render a rendition of Negro spiritual songs. I wanted to do a acapella. I had something else prepared, but I just felt like I wanted to do this instead. I just want to do a little collage of Negro spiritual. These songs were songs that gave direction to the slaves. They were in songs of inspiration. They were map songs. Songs like, Wait in the water, wait in the water, children. Wait in the water, God's gonna trouble the water. Songs like, Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus, steal away, steal away, home. ain't got long. To stay here sounds like swing low, mm -hmm. swing chariot, come in foot, carry me home. Swing, swing low, swing, swing, chariot. Oh, coming for to carry me home. Songs like Go Down. Moses, uh, oh, way down, way down in uh, Egypt, in Egypt land, and tell, oh, 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 ooh, tell oh, Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. My Lord, he calls me, yeah. He calls me by the thunder. The, the trumpet sounds within my heart. Ain't got, ain't got, we ain't got long to stay. Mm, ain't got long to stay.
I don't know what it did for you, but for me, it caused me to reflect back, to reflect back to the stories that we heard when we were children, to reflect back to whence we came from, and to thank God for where we are right now. We've come from a mighty long way. At this time, the Apostolic Faith Church Ministry will collect our offering, and then we will have the introduction of our guest speakers. Next on the program is a nice continuing education offering from two illustrious people. And I have the honor of introducing them. Because this is a continuing education offering, there's a couple of housekeeping things I must do first so we can make sure all of our ducks are in a row. For those of you who signed up for this offering, Chi Eta Phi Sorority is an approved provider of continuing educa nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. Completion of this program will award one continuing nursing education credit. As an attendee, for those who signed up for it at the front desk, to receive the continuing education credits, you must comply with the following. Sign in on the sign-in roster, remain for the entire presentation, and complete and submit the presentation evaluation form, which looks like this. When you're completing it, please focus on the ob learner objectives and give your honest rating of the presentations and give us any recommendations that you would like to see in the future, okay? In order to get your certificate, you must turn this in at the, when you, before you leave. You'll, be, you'll turn it in and then someone will hand you a continuing nursing education certificate. Our first speaker, Dr. Annie Lawrence is a retired professor who has two doctorates in education and an honorary doctorate, a Master of Science in Nursing, a Certificate in Public Health Nursing. Dr. Lawrence started her career in the nursing education in 1956 at Provident Hospital School of Nursing. Dr. Lawrence will share with us the historical significance for the progression of education in nursing in the nursing profession. Please welcome Dr. Annie Lawrence. Good evening to everyone Good evening. and to the organizations that have planned that plan such successful program friends, and to the church that allowed us to come. I come to you this evening as a senior citizen, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Seeing some of my former students in the audience has been a surprise. Because one, I've been trying to get to say hello for years, and today at least I saw her and said hello. My area is to discuss nursing education. Nursing is a profession within the healthcare sector 
focus on the care of individuals, families, and communities. Nurses are vital to helping people attain, maintain, and receive optimum health care and quality of life care. Nursing, nurses are apart from other health care providers through their approach in patient care, training, and scope of practice. There are many nurses working in socialized areas that can also offer different levels of prescriptive care. As a nurse, it is vital that we belong to our professional association. When we graduated, or when I graduated years ago, it was known as the Colored Nurses Association. And we had just been awarded the opportunity to become a member of the American Nurses Association. And I graduated from nursing in 1948. So you can see it has been a long time. What does this membership provide us? It provides us with an opportunity to meet other nurses, to learn from other nurses, as we have seen tonight, and to become educated ourselves. In the beginning years, black nurses were educated in schools of nursing, such as Provident Hospital School of Nursing. In the Illinois area, Provident Hospital was the first nurse, was the first school to admit two male black nurses. Provident Hospital was. And they were admitted under my direction as being director of the School of Nursing. Harlem Hospital in New York, Lincoln Hospital, New York, Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, and Freeman Hospital School of Nursing in uh, Washington, D.C. Grady Hospital, being a black institution, has now, and years ago, integrated their school of nursing and all persons were able to be admitted. Also, colleges such as Tuskegee and Hampton educated young people to become nurses, which we enjoyed having students graduating from baccalaureate programs. These institutions provided staff to instruct and educate, and educate young people on becoming nurses. Nursing practice, mainly in black institutions, before slowly moving into practice in white institutions. Whether people were black or white, most nurses received their education through hospital schools of nursing. Black nurses could not have membership in the American Nurses Association in the early years and the middle 40s. Black nurses, or colored nurses as they were called, had membership in their own organization, the Colored Nurses Association. 
But when I graduated from Freeman Hospital in 1948, my director of the School of Nursing said to me, you have an opportunity to become a member of the American Nurses Association, in which I did. And it was through the American Nurses Association coming to Chicago that I received information on my first, specific, first position in nursing. Colored Nurses Association during the time provided an association for us but it was not wide enough for us to continue the association. Nursing opportunities divided into fields of education, such as nursing service and nursing education. There is a difference in the two. Nursing education deals with the curriculum to educate the young people that you saw tonight. Nursing service provides an opportunity for those same young people to practice their skills. However, the educational qualification may not be the same. Education. One of the major changes in nursing was when colleges and universities established nursing programs within the junior college and senior college system. This was an asset to minority nurses seeking to become nurses. This movement was followed with major college offerings doing programs that admitted minorities. In Illinois, we are very proud and thankful for schools such as DePaul University, Loyola University, and St. Xavier University when they opened their doors to admit black nurses in the middle 40s. This movement was later seen throughout the United States. We have had leadership in some of the actions that have taken place in nursing. There was a moment on the number of blacks admitted to a baccalaureate program. In the middle 40s, I applied to Loyola University School of Nursing and was not admitted, but was placed on the admission list for the next year. However, DePaul was started its first nursing program. So I was at one of the first to apply and was admitted. I was accepted at DePaul University, which I received my bachelor's and master's. Nursing had to receive a special certificate to be employed and work in their specialized area of nursing for example, public health nursing in the state of Illinois. I worked in tuberculosis public health where I received my certificate to work in public health nursing, and that was tuberculosis. There was a time when Illinois had tuberculosis public health nursing and the nurses that provided care for tuberculosis patients did not and could not provide public health to other 
nurses in the, to, to, other, to other patients in the state. Professional nurses need education and experience in order to be considered qualified for a nursing position. And you see all the nurses that have stood up in various capacities here tonight. And we hope that our young persons that are in schools of nursing will continue their education and experience. For advanced nursing positions, one needs a degree coupled with leadership experience to be qualified. A master's education became a requirement for teaching in schools of nursing. Illinois has colleges and universities that allowed nurses with baccalaureate degrees to earn a master's degree in nursing. This achievement required time. This achievement requires time and effort to advance in the field of nursing. In Chicago, we were very proud of two of three black nurses that received their bachelor, their masters on the same day from DePaul University. And one of those persons was Betty Gross that served as director of nursing of Provident and Christine Allen who served as director of Malcolm X, and Annie Lawrence, myself. Can you be... <laughs> Can you believe three black nurses receiving a master's degree at the same time? At the same time, it was an achievement that we had to work hard to get. In furthering my education, I later attended and received my first doctorate from the University of Sarasota in Florida. And my next doctorate was from Illinois State University that's down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Professional positions. In the early 50s, I applied for a teaching position at Cook County School of Nursing, but instead was offered a head nurse position because we had a black nurse in that position and she died not too long ago. Cook County Hospital School of Nursing only had one black nursing instructor at that time when I applied for a position there. When I applied for a position there. I left the position at Provident. I left the position from Cook County and came to Provident School of Nursing. And I became a faculty member. I taught fundamentals of nursing. And when the director of nurses of the school retired, left, and went to the school health nursing, I was promoted to the director of nursing at Providence. I also served 
as curriculum evaluation and promotion at Mount Sinai Hospital on the west side that is here. When I left Mount Sinai School of Nursing, I was offered a position as Assistant Nursing Education Coordinator at the Illinois Department of Professional Regulations. And nurses know that that is the position that we approve schools of nursing, give state boards, and go to court when necessary for failure in nursing practice. I later became the chair of the Division of Nursing and Health Sciences at Governor State University and retired from that position in 1997. In order to advance in the nursing profession, one key point to know is that education and hands-on experience is very important. the legacy. The most rewarding part of my nursing career is to be recognized as a member, as a mentor to so many men and women choosing the nursing profession. And believe it or not, I saw previous students of mine here tonight that have advanced in education because they knew what would Annie say is that you must go to school. You must go to school. And there were times when nurses came back under my supervision at Governor's State and they looked me in the face and, they, and I would say to them, are you looking at me again? You told me you didn't want to see me again <laughs> because what did I say? You must continue your education. In my time as a nurse administrator, I have had the opportunity to encourage, develop, and support people from all walks of life, helping them to realize their passion and commitment to the nursing profession. This has allowed me also, with the education and experience, to write articles in professional journals and to serve on professional committees. Even though my journey wasn't easy, but challenging, I preserved and poured my heart and soul in striving for the best I could be to excel in nursing education. What was my line of education? public health nursing that I received a certificate from Loyola, Provident Hospital faculty and director of School of Nursing. And the School of Nursing at Provident was established in 1891, I believe that's correct. It was approved by the state of Illinois, 
because all schools of nursing had to be approved or have to be approved by the state in which they exist. I could not believe that Provident being organized in eight, around 1891, I believe that's the correct year, did not have accreditation by the National League for Nursing. And the National League for Nursing was the accrediting body for schools of nursing throughout the, throughout the country. When I became director, I said to the faculty, it will not last long if we do not get this program accredited. Provident, we got Provident accredited, and it was the first time they were accredited by the National League for Nursing. We also had belonged to the state of Illinois Student Nurses Association that we had a member of our Student Nurses Association to become president of the Illinois Student Nurses Association. I don't know how many people in this room can remember when there was a fire at one of the Catholic schools, I believe over Northwest, and students got burned up. We were holding a Student Nurses Association meeting the night that that fire occurred. They mentioned it on the radio not too long ago this year. And every time I think about it, it brings tears to my eyes. I also was the person that served as the faculty member to student nurses in the state of Illinois when we had the killings on the south side, the white nurses that got killed, the seven of them that got killed. And here I was among the nurses that their parents said to them, we do not want any black person around you. And those kind of experiences that I have had in nursing education bring tears to my eyes every time I think about it or hear about it. Even though my journey has not been easy, my membership in professional organization has not been easy. I always remembered that there was a God that I could pray, pray to, and he helped me to accomplish my goals. My mother always said to me, pray to God and you will always make it. Mount Sinai Hospital, I was curriculum construction coordinator. Evangelical Hospital, which is now advocate in Oak Lawn was 
Also, I was assistant director of School of Nursing. The people in Oak Lawn said to the administrator there, Dr. Myers, or Reverend Myers, that they did not want any black people in that hospital. So there was a black male there that had always been a friend of Reverend Myers and myself. And I became assistant director of the School of Nursing there. We did have a white director. That was another school of nursing that had not, that was organized the same way as Provident in the 1800s, that had never been accredited. And I was the one that got that school of nursing accredited. So we moved, I have always moved with the strength of God to let me do the things that he wanted me to do. Evangelical School of Nursing. I became the assistant director of the Department of Professional Regulations, State of Illinois. And believe it or not, <laughs> when that director left, that was white. There were two other white assistant directors and one black. And one day she called us into the office to have a meeting, our, our monthly meeting. And Mrs. Trepto made the statement that I am retiring. And I am recommending Annie to become director. Two of the white nurses left. I asked them not to leave, that I wouldn't do anything to them, but they left. But I was fortunate enough to get a male and a female to replace those positions. And from that position, I became a faculty at Governor State University and later was appointed the director of nursing and health sciences, which I served for 21 years. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I will do my best to answer them concerning this. Are there any questions for Dr. Lawrence? At this time, the Provident Hospital Women's Auxiliary would like to make a presentation to Dr. Annie Lawrence Brown. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. The Provident Women's Auxiliary, our president, Dr. Naila, would like to honor Dr. Annie Lawrence Brown my colleague Joyce Ball and myself, Marsha, any other members of Providence Women's Auxiliary here, please come forward. Good evening, everyone. What an auspicious occasion. Let me share a story with you. I've known Annie Lawrence Brown for a number of years. And when I found that she was going to be honored, I said, oh my God, we have to be there. And I called her and I said, Annie, this is Naila. 
And I understand that you're going to be honored. And, and I really, really have to come. She says, who is this? I said, Annie, I'm your soror. Yes, but who is this? So, Sora, Annie, here I am, and here you are, and maybe we recognize each other now because we sure didn't do it over the phone, okay? okay. We couldn't get it together. We'd like to present, in celebration of Dr. Annie Lawrence Brown, a card that we made for her. Uh, PWA, Provident Women's Auxiliary, exists after 60 years. We will celebrate our 60th anniversary in October of 2020. Dr. Annie Lawrence Brown, past supervisor, instructor, director of nursing education at Provident Hospital, School of Nursing, 1956 to 1962. Thank you for your many years of service to our community. to her for me. Can you give it to her? Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you want to ask any questions? Okay. Our next speaker, Bernice Mills Thomas, is Chief Executive Officer of the Near North Health Service Corporation. Under Mrs. Mills Thomas's leadership, the Near North Health Service Corporation has grown from one health center on the Near North side to nine comprehensive full-service health centers and two women infant and children ancillary sites that provide primary health care, primary health care, social services, and health and nutrition education to nearly 45,000 medically underserved, low-income women, men, and children throughout the Chicago metropolitan area. Mrs. Mills Thomas is a registered nurse and has a master's in business administration, master's of public health, master's of science in management and development of human resources, certificate in health policy and management, bachelor's of art in applied behavioral science with an emphasis on management and supervision. Her talk will focus on the social determinants and the future healthcare needs and services, as well as healthcare shortfalls and the threats they pose to societal well-being and overall public health. Help us welcome Bernice Mills Thomas. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Well, when I got here, I was like, um, to some of my colleagues, I have to follow her? Oh my God, are you serious? So I started getting nervous. I was like, oh my God. And so thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're continuing to do. We really appreciate that. So. As she said, I am Bernice Mills Thomas of Near North Health Service Corporation. Hello, Dr. Rupert Evans, colleague of mine from way back when. So it's really nice to be here and to see. And I couldn't actually think of a better place to be where um, I have been um, not really directly working in nursing for so many years. So I find myself sort of sometimes getting away from that and I have to leave my office and go upstairs and touch patients from time to time just to to feel like, you know, that, oh no, I'm once a nurse, always a nurse. 
So um, I'm grateful that I'm able to do that. Uh, but to be in this body with all these nurses and these nurses, I mean, when the nursing students started walking up, I mean, I started feeling a chill. It was like, wow, boy, we're, we're coming through. So uh, after all of that, um, I would really like to thank Dr. Tyra Usley, who is the Chicago State University Dean of Health, and um, a good friend of mine, Evelyn Reed, who also did not stand but is a Provident graduate. And uh, Evelyn, they nominated me for this, and I just wanted to say really thank you to them. Dr. Sandra Webb Booker, thank you so much. I mean, when she first called me, it was as if whatever she wanted me to do, I was supposed to say, yes, just do it. I mean, just, that's the way she came across. So I, I am so, so happy to, to be here and to meet you. Um, Bishop Horace Smith, thank you for allowing us to be here. And members of the National Black Nurses Day Planning Committee and for the invitation to be here to speak to you. Globally, the nursing profession is celebrating a milestone in 2020. As the World Health Organization declares the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife in honor of the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale. Here in the US, the American Nurses Association, the American Nurses Credentialing Center, and the American Nurses Foundation, the family of organizations comprising the ANA Enterprise, will celebrate the Year of the Nurse by engaging with nurses thought leaders and consumers in a variety of ways that promote nursing excellence, infuse leadership and foster innovation. The ANA Enterprise will elevate and celebrate the essential robust contributions of nurses in a number of ways. They will do this by engaging with nurses and actually showcasing a contemporary and accurate view of nurses and the critical work that we all do. Their goal is to raise the nurses' visibility and policy dialogues, because that's where we have to go, at all levels and spur expanded investment in nursing education, practice, and research, as well as increase the number of nurses who serve in leadership positions. We have to get that done. So let me just tell you a little bit about, um, I'm working for a community health center a community health center is a, is a special place because we have a special vision that health care can be provided to all, regardless of your race, your creed, religion, education, or your income level. Community health centers have a focused mission of providing health care to a special population of individuals that includes the uninsured, the underinsured, and those often marginalized by our society. Community Health Center's historical commitment to expanding civil rights and improving the health of black, brown, and marginalized communities dictates where we are located, how, and most importantly, why we are there and what we are there to do. When health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself. Art cannot manifest. Strength cannot fight. Wealth becomes useless. And intelligence cannot be applied. Herophilus, 335 to 28 BC. This was the physician to Alexander the Great. So you see all those many, 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 many years ago, uh, the focus was on health, because it's everything. <laughs> Health is a state, and I know I'm talking to the choir there, of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The social determinants of health inequities is what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about this evening. Nurses have always understood that health and well-being are social determinants of health. The social determinants of health are things like employment, unemployment, working conditions, income and its inequitable distribution, food insecurity, housing, early childhood development, education, the healthcare primary, secondary, and tertiary, 
social exclusion, which we're often excluded from, social safety nets, identity, including gender, race, social class, disability, and sexual orientation. Starting from black nurses like Harriet Tubman, black nurses have combined their nursing duties with a fight for social justice forever. And we continue to do that today. A social justice perspective prompts us to ask some really difficult questions. Why do certain groups of people consistently live in poverty and have poor health outcomes, despite remarkable technological and biological advances in healthcare, far less progress has been made in addressing those social determinants of health. Nurses, with its holistic model of healthcare, positioned to be a leader in improving healthcare by thinking of those social determinants to outcomes through analysis and action. How do these social determinants of health create health disparities? Well, it includes such factors as socioeconomic status, the environment, which includes the air that we breathe and the water that we, the quality of the water that we drink, food insecurity and food safety, education, employment, social networks, homelessness, and racism. Research has started to show how these determinants of health affects outcomes. Much more study is needed, however. What we know, though, what we know is that poor families lack of resources to pursue care that could cause a delay, could possibly cause a relapse, resulting in, in that relapse. Poverty and homelessness could contribute to and result from health problems. Homelessness can lead to further illness. Stress, anybody know anything about stress? And sometimes overt violence and experience of racism is well known, is a well known influence on both the mental and physical health. The environment plays a crucial part in our health. The link between one's neighborhood and one's health reflects multiple inequities in the environment. We all live in Chicago, so we certainly know that. This uh, CDC. Uh, is this leading an effort in trying to better understand the social determinants of health. And what they've done is they have a, uh, an initiative that's a culture and health initiative that they're looking at. One goal of the Healthy People 2020 campaign is to create social and physical environments to promote good health. Nursing can lead to translating the social determinants awareness into action by taking the following steps. Teach the social de determinants of health content in all of our clinical courses, with students routinely assessing what those determinants of health, uh, what they are in clinical settings, and advocating for change to improve them. They can develop interprofessional practice to include representatives of social workers. We can't just stay in a silo and say, nurses, take care of everything. We're going to have to work with social workers, public health, the city planning departments, occupational health, the police, the firefighters, and many others who can contribute to addressing those social determinants of health. We will prioritize nursing research on social and biomedical aspects of health to connect the determinants of health to health outcomes and develop nursing interventions that alleviates the problematic social determinants of health. We can also collaborate with social and community agencies and instructions to recommend that health policy addresses the harmful social determinants of health. The more things change, you guys could finish that for me, the more they stay the same, right? So figuratively speaking, change calls attention not only to what has changed, but also to what has remained constant to what has expressed itself in a new way despite attempts to change it. Access to health care impacts overall physical, social, and mental health and your quality of life. Some of the constants that we have barriers, it's the high cost of the care. Most of us can't afford to go, and if we don't have insurance, it's, you can almost forget it. 
inadequate or no insurance coverage, the lack of availability of services, the lack of cul cultural competence. And some of those barriers lead, lead to unmet health needs. They develop in receiving appropriate care, the inability to get preventive services, financial burdens, preventable hospitalizations. Access to care often varies based on the race, the ethnicity, the socioeconomic status, their age, your sex, your disability status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and residential location. It depends on where you live. Understanding access to health services encompasses three components. One, insurance coverage. It helps us gain entry to the healthcare system. Healthcare services, having a usual source of care results and better health outcomes, fewer disparities, lower cost. And three, timeliness to care, providing care promptly after a need is recognized. Once you know that you're sick, you're now able to go in and get something done about it and hopefully before that, before you know you're sick. Emerging issues, despite 20 million adults gaining health insurance coverage, significantly reducing coverage, millions of Americans still lack coverage. And we're beginning to see the trend that's still continuing to go in the wrong direction. For the second year in a row, the number of uninsured increased by 1.2 million. In Chicago, in 2018, the number of uninsured increased from 7% to 8.9%. That's the wrong direction that I'm talking about. Uh, data demonstrates, however, that there are significant disparities in access to care by sex, age, race, and ethnicity, and those things that I've already talked about, as well as your geography. Health equi equity threats to community health, the social determinants of health, inequities in community infrastructure, like housing, transportation, unequal access to education, segregation, we say the word, in 2020, community level violence. Medical care alone cannot and does not address what is actually causing poor health. There are factors that exist well before the healthcare system gets involved the frayed safety net, the economic instability, the housing instability, the racism and other forms of discrimination, the educational disparities, the inadequate nutrition, the food deserts that we still have, risks within the physical environment. So some changes can be made in organizing and, de and delivering medical care that can influence the social determinants of health. Um, the social determinants of health as defined by the World Health Organization are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, walk, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global national and at our local levels. As black nurses in America, I and we know that whether or not you have access to quality medical care depends on your race, ethnicity, money, and power. We know that changes made in organized and delivering medical care can influence the social determinants of health. The fact that the American African-American population is the least healthy ethnic group in the U.S. We are still subjected to systemic discrimination and oppression. In 1984, the Secretary of HHS provided the first comprehensive review of health disparities endured by blacks and other minorities compared to whites. The creation of an Office of Minority Health was established in 1986, two years later with a mission to improve the health or racial development of health policies and programs that would eliminate those health or some of those health disparities. 30 years after the report and a review of African Americans, we still endure unacceptable health disparities and lack the power and the policy. We've talked about the social di di uh, disparities of health, I'm sorry, health disparities, main health needs, and access to health services. 
But other recommendations have been offered to help frame policies and interventions to ameliorate the African-American health disparities. An example would be to include the main variables of health inequities, namely, again, race, poverty, and gender. Uh, these all influence the health needs, morbidity, mortality, and health risk of each. The social response to health need is represented by health services, policies, access, utilization, and workforce, which in turn influences health needs and risks by hopefully resolving or at least improving them. There are numerous provisions in the ACA that promote the elimination of health disparities through impacting the social determinants health disparities pathway. Organizations should be sure to take advantage of some of these opportunities by, number one, improving the collection and reporting the data by race, ethnicity, and language, strengthening the workforce by diversity, enforcing cultural competence education and organizational support, including development and evaluation of cultural competency models, elevating or establishing Office of Minority Health in various agencies within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, encouraging research in how disparities and the development of strategies to reduce them, particularly prevention. And number six, addressing those health disparities and in health insurance reform. Integrating the social determinants of health into healthcare cannot fall primarily on um, the primary care clinicians. Although frontline clinicians can see patterns of key determinants uh, for populations, leadership within healthcare organizations must advance this work by alignment with strategic directions, broad support for community partnerships, adopting a culture that values the social determinants of health in addition to quality and affordable health care. Measurement, evaluation, role clarification, creation of new skill sets, and realignment of resources. An example, building a system approach to integration. These leadership actions allow frontline clinicians to be natural champions for the social determinants of health within the organization and the community without being responsible for all of the necessary components of the system's approach. Again, social determinants of health are influenced by policies, systems, and environments. Now, the role of the African American nurses as trusted providers, all healthcare providers should be required to retain regular training and refreshers in provisions of equitable care. This includes providers of color. Training of young people of color in health professions should be viewed as an urgent national objective requiring the rebuilding of many of social development and community health programs of the past, which have been virtually extinguished by, guess what, a lack of funds. Nurses are the most trusted healthcare providers and are ideally positioned to play an integral role in moving the U.S. health system forward. Black nurses are critical for providing black communities better health care. Why do we say this? Because they are most likely, more likely, to practice in the underserved areas that comprise a large percentage of black families and are more likely to accept patients who are covered by Medicaid. They also have been linked to improving the quality of care that African Americans receive. It is no secret that many black men and women harbor strong feelings of mistrust when it comes to health care. More than one third of African Americans have reported feeling discriminated against when receiving medical treatment and care. Astonishingly, these feelings of apprehension that black people shoulder regarding health care are justified, unfortunately, I should say. Studies have shown that African Americans are less likely to get the standard of care that their white counterparts receive in areas such as pain management, asthma treatment, and just getting a simple aspirin in the emergency room. It is imperative, therefore, that more black nursing professionals are implemented into America's healthcare system. It's imperative. Patients are more likely 
to utilize preventive care services and report care satisfaction when treated by a health professional who shares his or her own racial or ethnic background. Studies such as these illustrate how black nurses can lessen the gaps in cultural competency, which many of their white coworkers cannot or will not do. Black nursing professionals provide an opportunity for communities of color to receive health care from people who look like and can relate to them. Diversifying the healthcare workforce provides an opportunity to destruct the systemic biases and racial inequities that persist in healthcare. The generations of mistreatment that black patients have faced encapsulates America's need for a healthcare industry that mirrors the changing population and can address the range of needs. Black nurses increase diversity in the field of health and reduce health disparities ultimately improving the overall health care for all patients. Diversifying the health care workforce provides an opportunity to destruct the systemic biases and racial inequities that persist in health care. In order to achieve these goals, not, black nurses must understand that the time for action is right now. In order to alleviate racial disparities in nursing, black nurse leaders must take an active role in standing up for their unrepresented peers. They must also take time to recruit and influence younger generations of African Americans and discuss the biases that exist in healthcare. In many racially marginalized communities, there is limited access to healthcare providers that reflect and affirm the patients served. It is crucial to diversify the pipeline of nursing professions, particularly registered nurses and nurse practitioners. With greater number of black nurses in the field, there is greater likelihood of creating and implementing solutions that advance blacks in nursing and eliminate the struggle to and access culturally responsive health care. The health of the American nursing profession, in addition to the health of all patients and consumers, depends on the continuous promotion of diverse healthcare employment, advancement, and education. Uh, just looking as I was thinking about this, I uh, went to the public hospital, Cook County, and their strategic plan. So what their some of the things that they're planning to try and do, um, it is nursing specific, is to have or to make specific investments in nursing in the coming years that will move Cook County Hospital closer to the magnet, magnet uh, status. A shared governance model is being implemented that will give frontline nurses the opportunity to share in decision making that impacts patient care practices and the work environment. Leadership development progress will provide critical training to enable nurses to advance their career at Cook County Hospital. Nursing residency programs will expose new nurses to uh, Cook County earlier in their career seeking process. Some of the smaller things, I guess, that we're doing at the Near North Health Service Corporation where I work, we're trying to uh, strengthen, strengthen our brand identity to establish a new mechanism for community outreach. We are rebranding, we have a rebranding initiative so that people will know what we are, who we are, and that they are always welcome in our doors. We're retooling our outreach efforts to better identify, assess the social service assets within our communities to build relationships with local resources and strengthen engagement with patients and community stakeholders. I'm coming to my end here. Uh, I, but I do want to say that modern people are under attack by various factors. Hazardous environment, stress, we, know we, we hear about work and life balance all the time, physical inactivity, we have to get us moving. Infectious agents, what's going on now? We're talking, everybody's talking about, everybody's forgotten about the flu. And we're all talking about, okay. Now, when I was researching this, the last thing I heard, there had been 1,600 deaths 
in the United States from the flu. So we can't forget that. Uh, so we have to, I know on the news it's more popular to, to talk about the other virus, but please don't forget what's happening with the flu and make sure that we're doing, doing things to, to prevent that. It is obvious that there is much to be done if we are able to achieve health equ uh, equality or eliminate health disparities in the United States and ensure good health to the African American population. A goal of Healthy People 2010 was elimination of health disparities. It wasn't achieved. It remains today. The greatest disparity between the total U.S. population and any ethnic group Guess what? It's found in African Americans. Racism, that I've repeated two or three times here, may be the most important phenomenon underlying black health disparities, exerting its effects through institutionalized systemic stigma and exclusion. As nursing continues to advance healthcare in the 21st century, the current shift in demographics coupled with the ongoing disparities in health care and health outcomes, will warrant our outgoing attention and action. As within health care workforce, the nursing profession in particular will be challenged to recruit and retain a culturally diverse workforce that mirrors the nation's change in demographics. This increased need to enhance diversity in nursing is not new to our profession. However, the need to successfully successfully address this issue has never been greater. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and sit. Thank you, Mrs. Mills Thomas. Just a reminder for those who signed up for the CNEs, turn in your evaluation to pick up your uh, certificate. You can see someone in the back or at the front of the, in the foyer before you go at the end of the program. Next, I'd like to introduce our chair, Sandra Webb Booker. Thank you. Thank you. I hope from the two keynote presenters that, we've that we now have a better understanding of the need to increase the pipeline, to enhance the pipeline from the classroom to practice, from the classroom to the hospital to the community. We need to increase the pipeline to ensure that all mankind, not one, but all mankind, all races, all humanity, have an equal chance for both education and quality healthcare services. At this time, we are about to award our honorees. This is the moment that you've been waiting for. Our first honoree is Dr. Annie L. Lawrence. We're honoring her for being the trailblazer that she has described herself as being. For being the one person that got provident NLN accredited in order for us to have our first black accredited school of nursing at Providence Hospital. <laughs> Dr. Lawrence, we salute you. Our next honoree is Bernice Mills Thomas. <laughs> Chief Executive Officer, Near North Health Service Corporation, dedicated to the removal 
of all obstacles in nursing, practice, and clinical healthcare delivery. We applaud you for what you're doing at Near North. Thank you. Our stay, mm -hmm, stay right here. Our next honoree is the Reverend Dr. Shirley G. Ellaby Fleming. It is an honor for me to just tell you a little bit about the Reverend Doctor. She is a graduate of the University of Illinois School of Public Health with a doctorate in public health, a major in community health science with an emphasis in maternal and child health, and a minor in health systems management. She is also and foremost a graduate of the Chicago Theological Seminary, where she received a Master's of Divinity in May of 2007. She moreover is a graduate of the University of Illinois College of Nursing, where she received her Master's of Science degree with a, a focus in community health and maternal child health, and she's a graduate of St. Xavier College School of Nursing. Now, just let me give you a quick little rundown. She is the current director of Faith Health Promotion and the co-director for the Center for Faith and Community Health Transformation. And this is through the University of Illinois at Chicago Office of Community Engagement and Neighborhood Health Partnerships. How many of you all knew that? Now you do. Her goal is to promote health equity and improve the quality of life in the community. She's being honored along with our other two honorees as a legendary nurse because of all that she has done. Let me share with you that she served as the first deputy commissioner of public health for the city of Chicago. Okay. And she was also a deputy commission, commissioner of public health for the Chicago Department of Public Health, a director of maternal and child health for the Chicago Department of Health. And in addition to that, she is a midwife. She is duly, duly applauded. So this is why we recognize Dr. I'm sorry, Reverend Dr. Shirley G. Ellaby Fleming. Our next honoree is none other than Dr. Eva Smith. Eva is a graduate of Winston-Salem State University in North Carolina, a graduate of DePaul University, Chicago, Illinois, Masters of Science of Nursing in Education, and a recipient of her PhD from Kansas State University in Kansas City, Kansas. Mm -hmm. 
We're recognizing Dr. Eva Smith because of her commitment to assist black students matriculating throughout the University of Illinois from beginning to completion. We're recognizing her because she served as a strong mentor for them, providing guidance for their academic success that she has also helped to mentor many, many nurses through their PhD programs to go on to obtain their doctorate degrees. Also, because of her influence in the church, she was one of the first individuals to recognize the significance of what goes on between nurses and parishioners within the church and to let nurses know that they're doing a valuable job as parish nurses and as nurses that hold small groups with their church community. That's why we're honoring Dr. Eva Smith. Our next and final legendary nurse honoree is Ruth Slaughter. <laughs> Ruth Slaughter, guess what? To Dr. Annie Lawrence, you know it. She's a graduate of your alma mater. Freedman Hospital School of Nursing, Washington, D.C., class of 1968. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from the University of Illinois College of Nursing. Her Master's in Public Health, Community Health Science was her emphasis from the University of Illinois. And from there, she went on to do advanced studies and advanced courses within nursing assessment and community health nursing at the University of Illinois and the University of Minnesota. She is the first African-American director of public health nursing at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Assigned that position back in 1994 to 2012. She is known for her work in the community in preparing parish nursing, influencing the church community. That's why we are recognizing Ruth Slaughter as a legendary nurse. Our next honoree is in the area of midwifery. She is none other than Dr. Beverly M. Hopper. <laughs> Beverly is a graduate of North Carolina Central University with her bachelor's of science in nursing. But let me back up. Beverly began her nursing education at Provident. Provident School of Nursing. And she could not complete her education there because the School of Nursing closed down. But they had a transition plan. They had a pipeline with the brothers, Copley Hospital School of Nursing, and Beverly therefore went on to achieve her diploma in nursing that began at Provident within the Copley Hospital School of Nursing in 1968. She is a graduate of Yale University with her master's in nursing 
at New Haven, Connecticut. She is a certified nurse wife as of 1973, a graduate of the University of Michigan School of Public Health in Ann Arbor, a graduate of the University of Illinois School of Public Health, and completed much of her doctoral studies in public health with a specialty in maternal child health. Beverly has helped to promote the pipeline from the classroom to practice, from Cook County Hospital to the community. That's why she is a legendary nurse. Our next honoree is Charlene M. Sanders. Charlene Sanders is a BSN, I'm sorry, a Bachelor's of Science in Biology major from Dillard University who went on to Georgia State University to obtain her BSN and then went on to the University of Illinois to get her Master's of Science in Nursing and specializing in midwifery as well. Her experiences include Miles Square Health Center, Northwestern, and the University of Illinois, as well as Norwegian American Hospital. She is a certified nurse wife and women's health group at Esperanza Health Center. She practices as a lead midwife at Norwegian Hospital. We are recognizing Char Charlene Sanders for her commitment to bringing them in and ensuring the welfare from birth until delivery. Our last honoree had to have surgery but her sister is here. We are saluting Paula Manuel. Is her sister or representative from the family present? All right. We are recognizing Paula Manuel, who is a graduate with her BSN degree from Chicago State University. who went on to the University of Illinois to complete her midwifery training. She served, listen everybody, from Providence as the assistant to the director of midwifery services at Providence Hospital of Cook County. We are saluting Paula for her commitment to our community. These are our legendary nurses and our midwives. Let us applaud them for their contributions to our well-being and our future well-being. <laughs> 